Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Inshallah, I want to take you to the court of uh, the single most important scholar in the history of Islam, that is none other than Abu Hamid Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad al Ghazali, rahimahullahu ta'ala. Imam Ghazali, in his era, was the leading scholar in Baghdad. But because of his sincerity, he felt he was insincere. He felt he was incomplete. Even though he's sitting at the most highest seat, or in the most highest seat in the Jamia Nizamiya University at that time, and all of the students are seeking counsel from Imam Ghazali, seeking lessons from Imam Ghazali, he feels that he's not complete. So he leaves on this journey, this journey to find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he spends many years, leaves his position as the head teacher of the greatest university of that era in the Muslim world, non-Muslim world. And he leaves on this journey. And he spends years on this journey rectifying himself, becoming more sincere towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the deen of Islam, completing himself. And at one stage, he is actually in Damascus on his journey, on his travels. And while he's on this journey, he settles in Damascus and one day in one of the large universities in Damascus, a lecture is taking place. The teacher is delivering a lecture and Imam Ghazali is like a janitor, a khadim, and just nobody knows him by face, <clears throat> that is Imam Ghazali, and he's sweeping away. <clears throat> he's doing uh, his chores. Imam Ghazali was that individual that people like us, even after we're gone, we'll never have, we'll never have any acceptance. What did we do to have acceptance? Imam Ghazali was that individual that in his lifetime, he already had acceptance in the Muslim world. His name was famous in the universities of the Muslim world. So he's in the university one day and the teacher's delivering a lecture in Damascus and Ghazali is a simple um, janitor in this madrasa, uh, living as a, uh, anonymously in Damascus. <clears throat> and the lecturer begins to quote Imam Ghazali to give evidence for the positions that he's trying to teach the students. So Imam Ghazali, rahmatullah alayhi, he feels in, in order to protect himself, these are sincere people anyway, but this is the level of his sincerity. In order to protect himself, that my name's being mentioned in the large gatherings of Damascus, Imam Ghazali packs his bags and he moves away from Damascus as well. Just because his name is mentioned in the university. Even though nobody knows who he is by person, this is Imam Ghazali. Imam Ghazali, rahmatullah alayhi, <clears throat> amongst the many works that he wrote, one work that he wrote was a letter that he gave to one of his students when his students sought advice from him. His student said to him that, Oh Shaykh, oh Imam, oh teacher, I've spent my life learning the sciences. I've spent my life learning knowledge. Now I want you to give me a wazifa. I want you to give me a model that I can follow in my day-to-day -day life so that I can achieve salvation in my grave and in the hereafter. So Imam Ghazali writes a letter to him, and this letter later on became a book which is known as Ayyuhal Walad, O oh My Dear Son, or Letter to a Disciple. Now, <clears throat> this work's content, without a doubt, it is relevant for students of knowledge, for ulama, for scholars. But there's one piece of advice in there that is generic, and inshallah, this advice I will present to you, inshallah, in the time that I have uh, in this uh, khutbah and present to you, inshallah, Imam Ghazali's advice for a recipe or a recipe of Imam Ghazali's advice which is for a successful life that we are all aiming to achieve. <coughs> Imam Ghazali, rahmatullah alayhi, says to his student in this book, he says, My son, I want you to ponder over the story of Shaqiq al-Balkhi. Shaqiq al-Balkhi was an early scholar of Islam, even before Imam Ghazali. And he was a very saintly man. Shaqiq al-Balkhi had a student. His student, was, his name was Hatim. Ghazali is saying to his student that I want you to pay attention to Shaqiq, the teacher, and Hatim, the student. And take counsel from this story that I'm going to present to you. Hatim one day is in the company of his teacher, Shaqiq. Great scholar. 
from Balkh. And Imam Ghazali Rahmatullah says to his student that one day Hatim sitting in the company of a Shaykh and the Shaykh asks him that you spent 30 years in my company. 30 years. Imagine that, spending 30 years in the company of a saintly man. You spent 30 years in my company. I'm asking you today, in 30 years, what have you learned from me? What did you take from me? So Hatim Rahmatullah Alayh, this student, this very noble student, he says, I took eight benefits from knowledge. What does he mean by eight benefits from knowledge? Meaning he took eight benefits from knowledge, meaning if he acts upon them, he doesn't need anything else. Eight benefits. So his teacher is interested. His teacher says to him, then Hatim, my student, you spent 30 years in my company. You took eight benefits from me. Tell me those eight benefits. Now the time is very short to mention all eight benefits. But I will mention three or four of those benefits, inshallah, azza wa jal. The first benefit that Hatim says to his teacher, Shaqiq, he says that I observed mankind. I observed people. We observe people as well. Nowadays, we can sit at home and on TV, you can observe what people are up to. What is Birmingham Small Heath up to? What is people in the UK up to? What are people in the Muslim community here in the UK doing? What are people in the West doing? It's good to ponder sometimes. So Imam Ghazali uh, uh, Hatim, Shakik student says, I observed mankind as well. I did fikr as well. I pondered as well. And I saw that everybody has an object of love. Something they love. Everybody has a ma'ashuk. Something that they love. Some people may love wealth. Some people may love their children. Some people may love their families. Everyone's got something that they love. But when I saw what people loved, I realized that everything that the people loved, it either accompanies them to the last illness before you die. Yes? Like your wealth. The wealth is with you till the moment you're on your deathbed. Then after this, you've died, your wealth does not accompany you even to, from the masjid or from the janazaga until the grave. Some, Shahatim says, some things that people loved, I found that people, they love certain things and after they died, it carries on with them, accompanying them, but only until they get inside the grave. Like your children. When you go to your grave, your children are standing above you and they bury you and then they leave. So Hatim says, I began to ponder about this, that everyone loves something, but everything that they love, it gives them no benefit after they are buried in their grave, in the barzakh, in the akhir, I give them no benefit. So Hatim then says that because I spent time in your company, O Shaykh, I spent time in pious company, I was able to evaluate my life, I was able to conclude my life, and I was able to come to a correct benefit. What was that benefit? That I should only love that thing which will accompany me and be with me inside my grave. And he says, I couldn't find anything other than a'mal saliha, pious, righteous deeds. I couldn't find anything other than reciting the Holy Quran. When I recite the Quran, this will come with me inside my grave. How? Reciting Surah, uh, reciting surah Mulk in every evening, Surah Mulk's recitation every evening is a means for protection from the punishment inside the grave. Surah Mulk will come and protect you from Azabul Qabr. He says, I didn't find anything that was going to accompany inside, inside, me inside my grave except reciting salutations and salam upon the Holy Prophet This will come with me inside my grave. This will be with me inside the Hashar. This will allow me to be close to the Prophet on the Day of Judgment. And this is something we should be regularly engaging in. I mentioned previously as well that every day the least amount of salawat and salam that we should be sending upon the Prophet ﷺ is 100 times. Abdul Hakim Muhaddis Delavi mentions this. And on the day of Jummah we should be increasing upon that. He says, I didn't find any benefit, anything that came and accompanied me inside my grave except seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
This is why on a daily basis we should be at least saying Astaghfirullah a hundred times. These are the things that will accompany me inside my grave. So he says, I then took a'mal saliha, pious deeds, good deeds, and I made them my friend. I made them my ma'ashuk. I made them my object of love so that it could be a light for me in my grave and it can help me on the day of judgment. This is the first benefit he took from his sheikh. This is why good company is very important. Because through good company, a person finds guidance. He spent 30 years in the company of a sheikh and he was able to find guidance in his life. Another benefit that he mentions, and I'll swiftly move on inshallah. Another benefit he mentions, he says, I observed mankind, I observed people. O oh, sheikh, O oh, teacher, I observed and did fikr pondered over people's states and I found that some people found nobility and standing in Urdu we say izzat in Arabic we say izza as well sharaf I found that nobility and stand some people consider nobility and standing in the size of their nations and their tribes some people feel that izzat and respect is that I have a big nation my nation is a big nation. Pakistan is a big, we're Pakistani and our nation is strong. Some people find sharaf in this. We're Iraqi, we're Bangladeshi, we're Indians. Some people, they find nobility in the, in the, in the size of their tribes. I'm from a big tribe, I'm from a big baradri. And a person feels fakhr, he feels proud of this, that my family, my baradri is a big strong baradri. He says some people are like this. He says other people I found that they, they had this opinion that sharaf, nobility, standing in society, respect was in the fact that they had lots of wealth and lots of possessions. Some people feel that they, some people feel that they are proud that we have a house in one part of the world, and we have houses over here as well. We have a large uh, line of cars outside our front drive. We have all the watches. We can travel the world whenever we like. Some people feel proud. Some people feel that pride and standing and izzat and respect is in this. He says, then I further went on to observe other kind of people. I found some other people, they felt that actually, Pride, standing, honor, respect is in having lots of children. I have a big family. My khandan, my family is big. I have 10 children, 10 sons. Some people feel proud that I've achieved everything in life. I've got 10 sons. I've got a big family. He says, I looked around still, yet again. And I found some people, they even feel that pride, honor, respect is in tyrannizing people. Stealing from people, forcefully usurping somebody else's property. Some people feel this is proud. Some people feel proud about this. We have this in our, in our society. You have people who look up to the mafias. They look up to gangsters. They look up to uh, people who are vicious in society. They look up to drug dealers. People who tyrannize other people. Grab other people's property. Some people feel proud about this. That I am... I am untouchable in this society. So he said, I looked at some people, they find that standing respect, honor, is that I'm untouchable in society. So he says, I looked at all of these different kind of people, he says, then I began to ponder. What is the hakiki, real respect and honor? He says, I pondered over the verse of the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna akramakum indallahi atqakum. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse of the Holy Quran, He says that indeed the most honorable among you in the sight of Allah is the one who is more pious among you, who is more God conscious among you, who is more God fearing among you. This is true nobility. Because look, think about it. A person, how can he feel that standing and honor in society is merely in the fact of the color of your skin. How can this be in uh, the, the reason for exclusivity? 
How can the reason for exclusivity be which part of the world you were born in? How can exclusivity only be in terms of which part of the world you're from? What color your skin is? Or whether you're born in a big family? How can this, these things you don't even have a choice over? You're born into these things. Because, because you're born into these things, how can this be the, 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 the ambition of life? from which all standing will come. Rather, nobility, honor should be in that thing which you have a chance, you have an opportunity to achieve inside your life. And what is that? That is to become God-fearing. That is to become God-conscious. That is to have taqwa. That is to be conscious that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me in my every action. And this is what we would call the wajh iftikhar the reason for having fakhr, the reason for having nobility, if somebody can achieve this inside their life. Because in this you have an opportunity of uh, your own efforts being exerted to achieve that thing. This is one point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, talking about taqwa, again Allah ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ وَسَّيْنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ نِتَّقُوا اللَّهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and indeed we have commanded those who received the books before you and commanded you that keep fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Allah ordered in the previous books. This is what Allah is ordering this nation, that we keep fearing Allah, that we keep being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we find that taqwa is what, that the, the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the religion of God, its basis, it revolves around God consciousness. Because when a person's God conscious, when a person's conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then his inner and his outward, he's successful in terms of both. But when a person's heart doesn't have any fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he doesn't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it doesn't matter if he does a thousand, a thousand times he proclaims to be something. If his heart doesn't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no change in him. There's no, there's no reality to him. This is why Lama Iqbal says, خِرِدْ نَي كَهَبِ دِيَا لَا إِلَىٰ تُو كَيَا حَاصِلْ خِرِدْ نَي كَهَبِ دِيَا لَا إِلَىٰ تُو كَيَا حَاصِلْ دِلُو نِگَاهِ مُسْلْمَان نَحِي تُو کچھ بھی نہیں If your dil, your heart and your foresight is not believing, then you've got nothing. So this is another point that he mentions and he makes. I'm going to swiftly move on, inshallah, azawajal. The next point he mentions. And on this point, there's something else that can be mentioned as well. That the society that we live in today, you know, all the things that Hatim observes in mankind and he sees that Hatim observes that all of these things, people are proud about them. Money, cars, respect, big families. All of these things that we find ourselves enthralled in today. Just have a look at society. Look how empty society is. We're in a materialistic world where pride is in how much I have and how much I earn. So people are, uh, are competing with each other in earning more of the dunya. But the, the, the irony of it is, is the more you earn from the dunya, the less you have. The less you have. The person who bought two new cars, he's more in debt than the person who bought one car. Because everybody's going to the bank and financing their cars, they don't even own their car. The person who bought the 15th watch from the bank, he's even more empty than the one who only has one watch. Because he's gone to the bank again and he's taken out a loan to buy that. The person who has 15 houses, he's even more in debt than the one who had one house because he's going to the bank and getting a mortgage and he doesn't even own any single property. People are chasing a mirage, it doesn't even exist. And when you die, you'll wake up and you'll realize that the things I should have concentrated on, the things I should have spent my life doing, those things I avoided, those things I ran away from, but only those things will benefit you now inside your grave. So this is the second benefit that he says that I uh, took from society. He then moves on, he says the third thing now, inshallah, very quickly because time is very short, there's a lot of things to say. He says, in the next uh, point, he says that, I observed creation. I said to my teacher, Hatim says to his teacher, I observed creation, I observed people, and I found that everybody is striving in earnest. 
Everybody is working intensely with great hardship to do what? To find food and livelihood. He says to such an extent, people are striving to find livelihood and food to such an extent that they even disrespect their own selves, their own bodies in order to earn food, in order to earn livelihood. And many a times they even fall into shubuhat, into dubious, doubtful income and even other times into haram just to earn something from the dunya. He said, I saw this in people. He says, then I began to ponder on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's statement where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا I began to ponder on the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and there is none that walks upon the earth whose sustenance does not depend on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I looked at these people and I thought, what silly people. They defame themselves. They disrespect themselves. They do zulm and tyranny upon their own bodies. They lower themselves in society all just to earn some bread. So I thought about the verse of the Quran where Allah says, Illa ala Allah rizquah, the risk is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, I, because of being in your company, my teacher, because of pious company, I was able to realize the misguidance of people in this regard. And what did I do? I understood that my provision, my risk, depends on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed my risk. It's been guaranteed. So what did I do? I occupied myself in things that will benefit my akhirah because my dunya is already, my dunya is already what? My dunya is already established by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dunya is already, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already taken the responsibility of my risk in this dunya. Why should I worry about that? I'll worry about the akhirah. This is amazing. Amazing advice. Your risk is written with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And people sometimes they don't understand what risk even means. What does risk mean? People think if I've got 10 million pound in my bank, that means I got a lot of risk. No, you don't. Risk, the definition of risk is that which benefits a person. The three pound from which you bought two chapatis and a bit of uh, curry and you ate that and it benefited your body, that was your risk. The 10 million pounds that's in the bank that you don't even touch all your life, that's not your risk. That risk belongs to whoever's going to benefit from that, your aulad and your children. The charity that you're going to give. That's their risk, it's not your risk. If you've got 10 houses, the one house that you live in and you benefit from, that's your risk. The other nine houses that you people make in Pakistan, them nine houses, whose livelihood is that? Whose risk and provision is that? It belongs to those uh, servants in Pakistan who sit in those palaces and they look after them. That's their risk. So we, mis we misconceive this point. We misunderstand this point and we end up going into dubious, doubtful means just to, in just to take some risk from this dunya. Like for example, once Imam Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi, one person came to Imam Sab. He said to Imam Abu Hanifa, the one of the great four Imams, he says to him that, look, I generally am a very sad person. I feel down. I feel depressed. I work hard. I make a good living. But I don't feel any happiness in my life. I can't sleep at night. I'm tossing and turning all night. So Imam Abu Hanifa says to him, he says, tell me what you earn. Give me your accounts. So this person says, I earn about five dirhams. I earn about five coins a day. So Imam Abu Hanifa says, tell me where you earn your five from. So he begins to uh, uh, tell the Imam that I earn these two from such and such a place. These three I make from this place. Imam Abu Hanifa says, you know the three coins out of your five, the three that you earn a day, those three, the income that you're getting it from is doubtful. Stop making that doubtful income. Stick to your two coins. Stick to your two coins. So he says, okay. He goes, will this make me happy? He says, yes, it's going to make you happy. So he goes away. Some time goes by. He comes back to Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa asks him, he says, how do you feel? He goes, alhamdulillah, I'm very happy. I get sleep at night now. I can sleep at night. My mind's clear. I feel sukoon, tranquility in my heart. So the students who are sitting around Abu Hanifa, they ask the Imam, they say, this person came some time ago. He's sad. He's making five coins then. 
Now he comes, he's only making two coins. He's making less. How is he more happy? He said the reason for his sadness was because of the means from where he's earning his money. Haram income will not give you peace. It will not give you happiness. Making money from doubtful means will never make you happy. You'll never sleep at night. You'll never sleep at night. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already written your rizq for you, why do you have to engage in haram, stealing, cheating, all of these things when Allah has already written your rizq for you? Yani that's the, 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 the sadness of a person's state that Allah has written your rizq for you, yet you still will go and do cheating, lying, all these other things to earn your livelihood. That's your kismet, that's your destiny then, that you went and engaged in those things. Ah, but this doesn't mean that we, don't, we sit down. This doesn't mean we sit down. Just like the birds leave in the morning with empty stomachs and they come back with their stomachs filled into their nests at night time, likewise, insan should also get up in the morning. He should go and earn a livelihood as well. But Allah commands him that you earn through halal, not through haram. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has risk is upon every... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has risk, Allah gives to everybody. There's one story mentioned in um, uh, Ismail Haqqi rahmatullahi's tafsir, commentary of the Quran. He mentions once Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, he strikes a stone, a rock, a big stone, a stone, a sakhra, and the rock breaks and there's another rock inside. So he strikes this stone and it breaks and there's another stone inside. So the third stone, he breaks it. The third time he breaks this stone, he finds that there's some sort of a dawda or an insect inside the third stone and he's got something in his mouth and he's eating. Allah Akbar. He's got something inside his mouth and he's eating. And <clears throat> Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he hears, he can do what? He can hear this dawda. He can hear this insect. And what's this insect saying? Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, Nabi Allah, he hears this insect inside the third stone with something in his mouth speaking. And what does he hear the insect saying? The insect is saying, Subhana man yarani wa yasma'u kalami wa ya'rifu makani wa yadkuruni wa la yansani. Glory be to the one who sees me and he listens to my speech and he, he, see, he knows where I am and he remembers me and he never forgets me. Allah will never forget you. Why do you forget Allah? Fadkuruni adkurkum. Remember me, I will remember you. Why are we engaging in those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want from us? These are some things for us to think about. Lastly, very quickly inshallah, in one more minute, the last point that Shakik rahmatullah alayhi, he says, Shakik al-Balkhi rahmatullah alayhi, student Hatim, he says to him, Shaykh, I began to ponder in people. I began to look at people. I saw that everybody relies on something which is created. They do itimad, rely on created things. Some people, they rely upon dirham and dinar. They rely upon pounds. They rely upon rupees. Some people, he says, I saw that they rely upon wealth and property. I should make another business. No, no, no. Go and spend some time in the masjid. No, 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 no. I've got three businesses. I'm going to make a fourth business so I can rely on this fourth business. So when I get older, I can then do Allah Ta'ala Zikr. He said, some people, what do they do? They rely on something else. He says, I began to ponder every person. Misguided. Relying on money, relying on property, relying on wealth, relying on everything. He says, I began to ponder over the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah ta'ala says, وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلَ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَالِغُ وَأَمْرِهِ قَدْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدْرًا What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Allah tabarak wa ta'ala says, and whoever relies on Allah, then Allah is sufficient for him. Indeed, Allah will accomplish his command. Indeed, Allah has set a proper measure for all things. Relying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, I didn't start to worry. I didn't start to take all these things as my little idols. What did I do? I shunned all those things and I relied only upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, you tie your camel. You tie your camel. But at the same time, you rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why the great uh, Jalaluddin Rumi rahmatullah alayhi. Rumi puts it in very beautiful words. Rumi says, Gar tawakkul mikuni darkare kun. What does he say? He says, Rumi Ramtullah says, the person who claims that he relies on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he should then start working hard in the dunya. Work hard in the dunya. 
Work hard in the dunya. But what does he do? He works hard, but he relies upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You make your effort, leave the conclusion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You leave the end outcome to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should in this country, and I finish with these words, in this country where we're living, very difficult circumstances. Our children are growing up in this society. We are growing up in this society. Our families are growing up in this society. It's our job to give an education. It's our job to teach Islam. It's our job to teach our children about Imam Razi, Imam Ghazali, about uh, Sultan Muhammad Fateh, about all our great people, about our deen, about our beloved Prophet wasallam. It's our job to teach the children in the homes. It's our job to give them an education. It's our job to protect them. It's our job to honor them. Then what do we do? We do tawakkul after that and leave the iman to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if we're not going to move ourselves, if we're not going to make any effort ourselves, how can we then uh, hope tomorrow that our children's iman will be saved? Shakik finally says, he says, my student, these are eight benefits you took from me in, in, by staying with me for 30 years. He says, I saw the Injil. I saw the Torah. I saw the Quran. I saw the Zabur. And I saw that all these four books all revolve around these eight points, amongst which three, four I've explained. He says, you've acted upon all these eight points. You've acted upon all the books that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to do amal upon these things.